become this figure who's just almost totally co-opted by the mainline Democratic Party establishment. No, 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 no. let me just ask you this, tell me what you think though. The Battle of London, 1940, British wife, United States reluctant to intervene, Japanese have yet to attack. As he moves toward defending England and London and looking for the U.S. government to intervene, the war itself will become the major focus. And that war, once Roosevelt and others throw the nation state behind it, puts him in a very different space. So in that sense, even domestic policy becomes more and more secondary as opposed to how we're going to deal with the gangsters and thugs yeah. who are trying to dominate Europe. So there's the other element in terms of unpredictable events that Niebuhr's responding to that moves him into a social democratic space that is more even pro-USA because the US, the U.S. Army and the Soviet Army are the only obstacles against the, uh, the Hitler uh, war machine. I want, Does that make sense to we only have a few minutes. We're going to open it up to questions not, in just a second. You're not too convinced. Huh? Oh, well, there's just so there's so much things. more to so go so for now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do one thing before. Uh, we want to open up to questions in just, just a minute. I want to take a second and pay tribute to one of the great theologians who's here with us today, James Cohn. And his book, uh, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And if we could talk briefly about this, because uh, we do talk in terms of uh, Reinhold Niebuhr and his experiences in Detroit and what happened along the way. Um, I, I always tremble when I, like you would say, I tremble when I think in terms of uh, summarizing someone's thesis when they're right here in front of you. But the truth is that uh, uh, J James's argument, Dr. Cohn's argument is that uh, Niebuhr did not do enough. He did not speak out clearly enough. He knew it. Things were happening. The, the, he spoke articulately about the cross and his theology again and again and again, but didn't equate the lynching tree to the cross. And that was a failure on Niebuhr's part to do that. And um, I, I want to. I would like to hear from all three of you, gentlemen, as to whether or not that's fair. One of the things I also took from the book was um, the comment that Dr. Cohn said, which is that he did. He knew it objectively. He he heard. He knew what was going on, but he didn't internalize it. He didn't see it through the eyes of the people who were oppressed and who's who were losing their justice. And I thought, how interesting. You know, I'm watching my own film now. I watched this film now so far maybe 30 times already. And tonight, listening to one of the things that Niebuhr himself said, reflecting on what uh, Dr. Cohn's idea was, it wasn't until he had the stroke that he saw his wife in a different way. So, but if we look in the bigger question of race and what he did and didn't do, I, I have to say that um, Andrew Young, who I spent quite a bit of time with uh, Andrew Young, uh, he's just a marvelous guy, and he could not have been more positive and affectionate towards the theology of Reinhold Niebuhr and what it meant to the civil rights movement, and yet maybe we have to look at something that was lacking. These are, not, these are challenging questions to be sure. Um, I think that I would just echo some of what the, 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 the transformation of Niebuhr over his career in terms of what he's saying in the 19 teens, 20s, his work in Detroit, and then becoming maybe a little bit more establishment and I also think we do need to be mindful of his context and be careful about reading backward into uh, how, how enlightened he might have been or could be. He sort of steps forward and step back. And I think Dr. Cohn has actually captured it as well as anyone, and he wrote the book about Niebuhr's both honest and ambivalent over his time in terms of race relations and radical and moderate. You can find moments where he's radical, you can find moments where he's a gradualist and moderate, and it makes a very complex portrait. And those are, uh, those are uh, uh, characterization that Dr. Cohn had offered that I find very helpful in framing Niebuhr in his moving out and stepping back. Uh, I'll offer this not as a, a satisfactory answer for Niebuhr into the early 50s when he is getting more conservative, but he starts to go after Billy Graham more sharply because he sees Graham as possibly able to move, I think, the needle on some racial justice uh, in a way that maybe he can't. He's removed, he's ill. He writes an article about every two months and just pretty much just continues to put pressure on Graham, which ultimately frustrates him. 
Uh, but he is trying to do something. This is post-stroke, after 1952, and in anticipation of Graham's New York City crusade. So uh, it's, a, for, it's an ambiguous answer coming from me, uh, but I really do want to harness the words of Dr. Cohn. Honest, ambivalent, radical, and moderate, and it kind of depends on w where you're looking for Niebuhr, and that doesn't necessarily make for a satisfying record overall. Well, I think I'll just pick up there, um, because in that back and forth with Billy Graham, um, Niebuhr indeed called at me. It was halfway through one of his typical rants about Graham. First, we should just say Niebuhr was embarrassed about the influence, the reach that Billy Graham had. But where are where did these people come from that he is, you know, filling football stadiums with? Uh, he's blown away by that. And in fact, as an apologist for his kind of Christianity, he's embarrassed that this is this is being called Christianity to the masses. And that's, Billy Graham represents something to Niebuhr that is an embarrassment for Niebuhr. And so it brings out of Niebuhr a certain kind of polemic that's almost distinctive when, you know, when it's this subject. So, in the middle of one of these typical rants against Graham, uh, this is in the Christian century, uh, Niebuhr suddenly switches course and does something that he very rarely does because elsewhere he's eloquent about why you shouldn't do this. That is why you shouldn't call out people uh, in this way uh, because that always shows the sin of hubris. Uh, white liberals calling out other people because they're trying to cover up their own racism, right? And so he is wary about that uh, and he'll talk about it. And yet in this particular case, he, he goes ahead and does it. But look what he's doing. He's calling out Billy Graham into a zone of danger, of, of, uh, of possible harm that Niebuhr himself, a step that Niebuhr does not take. I mean, Billy Graham, to have to challenge the racism of his everyday audiences, uh, would be putting himself in some danger and certainly a risk uh, of uh, these crusades not going very well. Uh, Niebuhr's, that's what Niebuhr's calling him to do, but Niebuhr won't do that in his own circles. Um, asking white liberals of the 1950s uh, to interrogate their own racism is something that is not going to go well precisely for, for reasons that in fact block Niebuhr because liberals of the 1950s do think of race, racism as just racial bias. Right? And they're not going to be guilty of that. No, they're liberals. That, that's what it means to be a liberal. I'm not biased, right? And there is no, for all of Niebuhr's brilliance in explicating and talking about racism as self-worship, as evil self-worship, I think it's as good as you can get if that's your model for talking, for speaking of it in those terms. But there isn't, there isn't the the understanding of, of racism as white supremacy, as a structure of power based on privilege that presumes to define what's normal. And so he can say all manner of things about the cultural inferiority of black Americans and Arabs and right down the line. There are pages of Niebuhr that make very embarrassing reading um, anytime he gets anywhere near a subject of that sort uh, because he really does lack the, the understanding of white supremacy it to itself as a structure of power. Yeah, I think Professor Cohn, Brother Jim's critique is a very subtle and sophisticated one, but it comes from a tradition and a lens through which he looks at the United States that is relatively alien to not just Niebuhr, but the tradition that produced Niebuhr. Because you don't get it in Rauschenbusch, you don't get it in the, the social gospel either. And it is the notion that even given Niebuhr's anti-racist sensibilities, we know that as a liberal, he was anti-racist. He took stands with black people in Detroit and so forth. But theologically, analytically, he does not see white supremacy as fundamental foundation for the American empire, vis-a-vis -vis indigenous peoples as well as enslaved people. He didn't have the historiography for it. He didn't have the, the, the imagination to conceive of the nation. And it's rare, actually, for first-generation voluntary immigrants to view America in that way. He grew up speaking German. 
way off in the Midwest. You know, he makes it to Union. This is the American dream up with social mobility. How in the world could America provide this opportunity with me? Have you looked down the street in Harlem, Mr. Niebuhr? That's not an issue of bias. That's slavery. That's Jim Crow. That's lynching. That's American terrorism. All the lynching that took place between 1924 and 1960s, he had nothing to say. Now, he does become more conservative. I call it Burkean in the for late 40s and 50s. So when you read those essays on Brown v. Board in 1954 and 55, right in his wonderful institution, Christianity in Christ, he used to be right across the street. You remember that, Jim? It was right across the street. We used to go back and forth, have dialogues, with magnificent white brothers and sisters there. But boy, you got to put the pressure on them. This is not just a matter of moral bias. This white supremacy cuts so deep that even when fellow citizens would vote for a neoliberal centrist black president, that there'd still be a white backlash. So you get this mendacious, mediocre Donald Trump in over his head, out of control. Most people agree does not belong anywhere near the White House but wins and thinks he's got a mandate. Now that's just not Donald Trump all by himself. That's fellow citizens. That's America. He just ripped the veil off. My God, we thought we got over this. And Jim Crone is saying, I was trying to point this out to you all all the time. <laughs> These chickens gonna come home to roost if you don't hit them head on. Cause they out there. And for black folk, over 400 years, you see a Donald Trump, you see a brother Trump, you know exactly what you've seen, because you've seen many of them before. This time, he happens to be the head of the empire and has his finger on the nuclear button. Jesus, be with us. Faith, faith in America. Faith in America. We have a few more minutes, um, so if there is a microphone in the center. Uh, if you want to come forward and ask a question, if you would, direct it to whoever you, you'd like a response from. We have, uh, Gary, ten more, five more minutes? Ten minutes. Thank you for this uh, wonderful film. Um, you know, the, uh, it was great to see Mike Wallace, and you know, there was a media we had back in the 50s where you would have someone like a Niebuhr on TV. Uh, I'm going to have to rush home and watch Cornell tonight. Uh, what are you on, by the way, Cornell? What time? Uh, mostly Sean Hannity. So oh! Don't oh my. expect the highest quality dialogue. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering if, we, if this is not a moment uh, for the revival of a spiritual left. Mm -hmm. And what is going on with that project of a spiritual left? I, I've been active with the NSP, the Network of Spiritual Progressives, co-founded by you, and Michael Lerner uh, about 10 years ago. And, but, you know, I think this is a moment here, right? And wh where is that going? And you have a pope who is critiquing capitalism. You have a moral vacuum here in the United States in politics. You have inequality of wealth, which is uh, uh, an anti-spiritual reality, if you look at the Gospel of Christ. Why can't all these things just sort of be put together as a puzzle in a pragmatic way? Like, uh, Niebuhr was very practical and pragmatic. Build around a new politics that's spiritual, that's political, and that confronts Trump. And just let's start and let's do it. Why can't we do it? So. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Anybody want to pick up on that question? <laughs> I, I just well, want to, I, you know, I'll add this. I, I've been uh, doing this kind of work for a long time. I, I came, I got interested in doing the religion thing um, in high school because my, my high school teacher took me to, to soup kitchens and got me involved in all of this, and I, I sort of got wrapped up in it from day one. And I, that, I've been on this track now for the last 40 years, and, and I have to say, 
uh, despite the fact that I am scared to death what's going to happen next week or the week after in this country, uh, the truth of the matter is it is going to be an opportunity for the churches to rise, to speak, for theological reflection, to put all of this not just in sort of a moment of chaos, but just to respond some, from a thoughtful, historical foundation that's deeply rooted in a, a sense of who we are as human beings in the face of the divine. Um, to respond directly, of, I think uh, the NSP still exists. Uh, uh, of course, it puts out uh, Tukun magazines. Some of us write for Tukun uh, quite uh, often. I think that I have a kind of two-sided point to make about this. I think if if you are a long timer involved in in community organizing in uh, in IAF or PICO or DART. Uh, or Gamaliel, uh, or interfaith worker justice, or let's say you're more inclined, you've been involved in some kind of civic uh, activism or, or, uh, or uh, civil liberties uh, work. I mean, an organization like the American Civil Liberties Union has a tremendous history. Um, and it has seemed a little bit, you know, fuddy-duddy to us uh, at times, back and forth. And yet, that's, that's an outfit that does just absolutely essential work, has done it its, its entire time that it's been running since First World War, and I think is probably in a moment right now, one, it's going to be more precious, more needed than ever. Uh, if that's, if, if, you, 